I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on our agenda is um, the consent agenda. Approve the executive session minutes of January 22nd, 2013. Special Town Council meeting minutes of January 14th, 2013. Executive session minutes of January 14th, 2013. Set February 19th, 2013 as a hearing date for the commercial haulers license filed by T&J Sanitation. Anything need to be pulled? Yeah. I'm uh, pull the, uh, both the executive session minutes. Okay, with, with that, I will make a motion that we approve the consent agenda with the exception of the executive Senate session minutes uh, list, the two uh, executive session minutes listed in the this consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, first public forum. Anybody out there wishing well, to speak? Why are we pulling January 14th? Oh, did did I say January 14th? Yes. Well, I thought you said both executive both sessions. Both, you said. So oh, oh, okay. So yeah, he pulled them, and will they'll have to come up in another meeting. Oh, he pulled them. He like, pulled both. Right. So oh, okay, he didn't just pull them for immediate. Right. He pulled them for. Hold. Later. For take, later. take them off. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Everybody's got to read them, and also there might be some errors. In it, so. okay. okay. First public forum. Anyone out there wishing to speak? Okay. Next on the agenda is the town solicitor's report, Brushy Brook Shab decision. Pat? Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that Shab upheld the planning board decision in Brushy Brook, which was a terrific victory for the town. Um, and there's kind of congratulations to go around, starting with the planning board, which did an amazing job um, from the get-go on that because it went over a long period of time, multiple hearings, lots and lots of hearings. And um, if it wasn't for the great work that the planning board did, there would have been you know, no chance of, of prevailing at Shab. The second place I want to direct congratulations is to Scott Levesque in my office, who put his heart and soul into this thing. And I'm really happy that it worked out for his sake, because he just, he really put his heart and soul into the thing. And he did a fabulous job with it. And then the last place is with the Shab board itself. Um, one of the things this showed us is that cities and towns are now going to get a fair shake basically when they go in front of this board this is a brand new board all new people that were recently appointed no holdovers from the previous board um, a complete blank slate new chairperson in the chair um, you know and they were a fabulous bunch it was a unanimous decision which is crazy from mm -hmm. that board a unanimous decision in favor of the city or town um, and it was very comforting to us to see that this new board is going to be much more open, obviously, to the arguments that the cities and towns are making. The um, Westerly Sun ran an editorial that was terrific, in case anybody didn't see it, um, congratulating the town. And I just wanted to read you a couple of sentences from it. It says, the Hopkinton Planning Board deserves to be proud of its work in this case. That's absolutely true. It says, the Hopkinton board did a thorough job going up against a state law that is seen by many as a steamroller. Board members set the standard for other towns battling such bloated projects seeking to exploit a law that we agree is flawed. They've done the region a huge service. And I just couldn't have said it better mm -hmm. myself. They, you know, they did a wonderful job and they, everybody should uh, pat them on the back when they see the planning board members. And we're, we just could not be happier about this decision. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Hey, next up. Could I, so, could sure, I do a quick sorry. comment? Yeah. I think I think I because I just I'm still wow. I'm yeah. still in the wow mode, and um, and and um, basically I just said to people, you know, we're, we'll just do what we have to do. We'll appeal their decision. We just, you know, it was going to be another whatever. Rubber stamp. Yeah, and that didn't happen. It wasn't that we won. It was that they they listened. They took their time, and and I'm and I'm just so proud of everybody you mentioned. And it is in, in the calls that we've been getting, um, people are very excited that, that this happened. And it is a state, it affects the entire state. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you to, uh, to all involved. And um, I, I'm, still, I'm still flabbergasted. <laughs> yeah, sure, Bob. Um, I'd also like to thank the planning board. I'm the planning board liaison, and I have been at many of those meetings. And I mean, they have discussed this for a year 
or in longer, um, in incredibly long um, discussions, detailed discussions, listened to so many people from the town, uh, allowed everyone to speak fully, and um, Howard Walker in particular um, on the board, the whole board, but Howard Walker really helped pull that together with Scott Levesque, um, and Scott did a great job. It just was, you know, the best way for a town and its citizens and its uh, commissions to work. Mm -hmm. It was excellent. I'd like to comment. Sure, Scott. <coughs> First of all, I do commend our planning board, plan, uh, com commend our solicitor, and it shows that when you have the, uh, the goods, if you will, and you address a board which is quasi-judicial, I would say, uh, and you have to make a case, and it's not based on emotion, it's coming up with the, the goods and the points. I'd like to take an opportunity, because I'm usually a critic of Charaho, that I understand uh, Superintendent Barry Ritchie did provide input as far as the impact of that development on school children. And I want to take this opportunity of saying something positive about his contribution because, number one, I'm known as probably one of the leading critics of Charo in Hopkinton. And I think that his testimony was very important because we're very concerned about development and the impact on our schools. And I just want to say that. Uh, so we can bask in, in, in a great victory. Uh, certainly the planning board uh, in uh, solicitor and I know a lot of us might be tempted to take credit, but, uh, and there was a lot of people, uh, just regular citizens. I know there was a petition a, a few years back regarding that, and uh, so it's a great victory, and uh, uh, we can certainly savor that, and we'll see what the future brings as far as uh, those type of issues. But uh, the impact for other communities, it was a learning experience not only for Hopkinton, but many other towns. Uh, how they're going to prepare for this. So this is like a textbook case, if you will, I think for all the communities in Rhode Island. Thank you. David? You know, I'm just, uh, I'm extraordinarily pleased. Uh, it's just not the schools that would be affected by this. It would be the, the fire departments, the police department, the highway department. Groundwater would be affected in the area, um, the aquifer. So it's, um, this town as other towns have to grow over a, a certain period of time. But to, uh, to have this kind of impact just like that on the town, uh, no town should have to, have to tolerate something like that. So uh, I'm extraordinarily pleased. I really am. Yeah, and it also, uh, to thank the planner, Jim, uh, Scott Levesque from Pat's office, it, it speaks volumes, I think, too, to, to the way that we incorporate the affordable housing into our account plan and everything that we do. I think that really, really... That was a huge Huge, part. Mm -hmm. huge part of it, you know, and we're not just kicking the affordable housing uh, piece aside. We're incorporate, actually, actually incorporating it in, our, in everything that we do going forward. So uh, I think our percentage of affordable is just under 7%. So we're, we're, we're volumes ahead of any other town in the area when it comes to affordable. So I think that also uh, helped Absolutely. our situation too. But uh, I want to thank everyone also uh, that was in, involved in the decision. You can still get appealed, by the way. I probably should have yeah. mentioned that. The developer can appeal it to the Superior Court. Um, as of the decision being rendered, they weren't sure if they were going to do it or not. So we'll just have to wait and see. But I, yeah. it, it, it's sustainable in Superior Court, so we're not too concerned. Oh. Great. Uh, let's see. Next on the agenda is the town manager's report, Bill McGarry. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, during the month of January, I spent the majority of my time working with uh, finance director Laura Kenyon, preparing the town's uh, FY 2013-14 annual budget, and that was delivered to the uh, town council on February 1st. And lastly, I worked with uh, town labor attorney uh, Vin Regasta, uh, solicitor, uh, Patricia Buckley, Director Laura Kenyon, and the local police union to uh, help resolve three previously unresolved uh, contract issues. That leaves uh, one issue remaining, and we're currently addressing that, and hopefully in the near future we'll be able to resolve that last uh, uh, contract negotiation. Um, Is that a major issue? Um, major issue, Bill? Uh, no. no. Okay. We don't anticipate any problems. Good. Any and questions Thank for you. Bill? Well, I want to thank you for uh, putting those budget uh, for us together in a nice format. Great job. The binder and all the uh, the uh, sessions, the budget sessions we have. Very nice to have it all concise and not, you know, 
Oh, and page numbers. Yeah. Page numbers. Oh my God. Yeah. Page so, numbers. Classic. It was fabulous. It was, and Joyce did a great job. I was just going to say, I'd like to take credit for that, but that's oh, my secretary, Joyce. Yeah, she did all that work, oh, and she did a nice job. Yeah. It's very user-friendly. Yes. yes, very okay. much so. Okay, anyone else have anything for Billy? Yes. Okay. Um, next on the agenda under new business is um, consider, discuss, and act upon the agreement between the Town of Hockington and Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management to enable the town to receive a grant in the amount of 25000 to fund a town-wide stormwater management program plan. Um, I know Bill, the town manager, has been involved in this from the very beginning, and I'll probably just uh, turn it over to you to, to get that going for us. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, as you uh, can see in your uh, packet, uh, you have the proposed agreement between the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and the town of Hoppington to finance a, a town-wide stormwater management uh, program. Uh, plan through the use of a $25,000 grant from Rhode Island DEM. Uh, town planner Jim Lamphere has been working very closely with uh, Deputy Chief Sue Cannon of DEM, uh, the o uh, Office of Water Resources, to fund this plan. And I've asked uh, both of them to come this evening in case the council had any questions. Now, although the uh, proposed agreement uh, provides for the development of this plan, uh, it includes a 25% soft match that the town has uh, already accounted for uh, through its in-kind services. This agreement, uh, this proposed agreement, has also been reviewed and approved by uh, town solicitor Pat Buckley. Now, how this came to light is that we are one of the only uh, few towns uh, in, in the state that does not have a stormwater management plan and uh, we're required by law to have one uh, by the Rhode Island General Laws. Um, and basically, uh, it's entitled water pollution, which prohibits the discharge of pollutants into uh, the waters of the state. Uh, Fuss and O'Neill, the uh, town's on-call engineering services, and uh, engineer uh, Jim Riordan, who's also with us tonight, has also made a separate proposal that we'll hear after this uh, to draft a stormwater management plan and three standalone ordinances are customized for the town for inclusion uh, into the town code of ordinances, which may uh, may be required pursuant to the uh, MS4 uh, stormwater general permit. So this is a, uh, a, a basic agreement uh, that's, as I said earlier, has been approved by the solicitor's office between the town and DEM. Uh, this money is, uh, is available now, and we're required by statute to have a plan so after considerable discussion, we thought now would be the time to move forward. Um, uh, DEM has uh, projected a, uh, a completion date by uh, December 31st of this year. Okay, the, the only qu question I had, I guess, and I'm not sure maybe you know, Bill, is just maybe to frame this up a little bit. Um, th initially, this is just for town-owned buildings for this management plan? You know, I'm gonna defer to... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Sue Cannon from okay. uh, DEM. My question too. Can I answer uh, Please come to the podium. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Sue Cannon. I'm the deputy chief in the DEM Office of Water Resources, okay. and. Your question. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if it, at this point in time for this plan, does it actually just, uh, is it just pertain to town owned buildings at this point? And then would it eventually spread to commercially private? It, it relates to town owned st or controlled stormwater infrastructure. So it's not limited just to the buildings in the impervious cover, but also to drainage system piping and catch basins oh. and uh, possibly drainage swales that the town owns or has some responsibility for it's okay. All right. yeah, so, uh, yeah, let's and start. Par part of the project will actually lead to better characterizing and defining just what that is the department recognizes you're one of our more rural communities yeah. mm -hmm. um, there have been 36 of these grants given out to to communities across Rhode Island um, and so we're familiar of working with some of our towns that are less densely developed and you may find out that there's a fairly limited amount of infrastructure that you own and control, and the state obviously recognizes um, that some of it's owned and controlled by the state, including our right. Department of Trans Transportation. 
Yeah, so just one more quick question on that. Do you think that this would actually might spread out to private uh, homes and, and commercial buildings down the line, or you think it, that? It depends on the connection of those properties to the stormwater, stormwater yeah. Yeah. infrastructure okay. that you you have as a community. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll start, Barbara, you know. Yeah, so I, I want to just follow up. That was mm -hmm. my question to Frank, really started it is that this is all municipal land, municipal infrastructure. So it's not just our town buildings, but it's all of the swales, all of the, um, um, anything that's near a road that would take care of stormwater. So you'll look at both the state owned as well as the town owned. I think one of the objectives in this process will be to help clarify where the state, particularly mm -hmm. through the D DOT has ownership and control versus a town road or town drainage uh -huh. drainage systems it really has to do the some of the regulatory jurisdiction has to do with the actual discharge from a storm drain system so there mm -hmm. needs to be a pipe or a conveyance that comes to a point that discharges that storm water into a, a water body mm -hmm. that's and then you map back from that and depending on what it intersects with and connects with um, it will influence the area the town would be most concerned at looking at whether there are any needed improvements or changes and that would be something commercial manufacturing residential if they actually have an issue with the both state and municipal infrastructure then Fusson O'Neill the engineer would be able to let us know that there are problems coming up down the road and that we need to address them or need to be aware of them and see what we can do with them right so the planning process will actually bring together the physical infrastructure and and, and define the, the town's role and responsibility in that and also acknowledge where there may be other infrastructure, which might be privately owned even, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's dealing with stormwater in the town. We're gonna couple that with information on the natural resources of the community, the surface water resources of the community, the condition that they're in, and our current state of knowledge on where there's water quality problems. And where those two things intersect, uh, there'll be, it'll lead to recommendations about projects that might be undertaken in the future um, if necessary, to, to link to fixing water quality problems. And especially since we have so many rivers and streams and ponds right. and water. So everywhere. one of the things in this watershed, the state has looked hard at um, bacterial contamination mm -hmm. in our waterways and given the high recreational use of the wood hole, entire wood For pocket sure. watershed, um, there may be that would, might be a typical kind of thing that would be come up as a project that, to help control the loadings of those pathogens into the waterways through stormwater. And that's done through just better treatment mm -hmm. of the stormwater before it hits the, a river or stream. Very good. Thank you. This will be, I think, a good, a good thing for us. Very good. Cool. David, do you have anything to say? Sure. No. Good. 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 Um, I think that uh, Doug, uh, and Chris was preliminary, but Doug Reese had been working well on this project, not this particular, but on stormwater um, drainage and knowing that this was something the town was going to have to do. And he worked with the GIS and they were, mm -hmm. they were locating all of these catch basins, et cetera, all over town. Yes. Um, and they completed that and that was, became part of our order because it, that's part of our assets. Um, I don't know how well some of these things are have been. Uh, I, I think they found out that, that some of them are in you know disrepair, but uh, but anyway. So um, so I know that this has been something that we've been, in a sense, knowing we had to do and also dreading, and um, because it's such a it's such a big responsibility. Um, but we appreciate very much that we've received a grant uh, mm -hmm. to help us to do it because that makes all the difference for us. Thank you. We look forward to yes, uh, the two questions or comments. Uh, has, has it, what has your agency done as far as the state roads in town, which obviously wouldn't be under the jurisdiction of the town, with, with the same concerns and dilemma? Um, so our department, there is a regulatory requirement for our state Department of Transportation under the Clean Water Act provisions that apply to the town. They also apply to the state and they apply to transportation agencies. So DEM has an ongoing uh, conversation and working arrangement with the Department of Transportation to try to work with them to prioritize where they're doing maintenance, prioritize retrofitting of their infrastructure. Um, they clearly also face a pretty significant lack of resources to do everything that you'd like to see done, but to, we're working with them on that. So we recognize that the state 
has to be uh, pursuing stormwater management, improving it in the, you know just as vigorously as we would we would encourage towns to do the same. I know that we have a lot of storm boards and commissions in town. One of them was a wastewater management mm -hmm. district uh, commission of waste, uh, which needs members. So just to put the word out to the public, there's no requirement to have a committee of the public uh, involved. I know you talking about different people being involved in the process for doing this project, but do uh, uh, <coughs> you know how the, many the communities actually have a wastewater committee? You mean like a comparable committee for stormwater management? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Com comparable In wastewater communities? This might be a little off the subject. But um, still I think very, I would answer that very few have established committees for that purpose. Um, and what's being actively discussed in Rhode Island are, are the, there is, because there is state enabling legislation for stormwater utility districts. So our most urbanized communities um, that have a much higher cost involved in maintaining their infrastructure are looking at options for how to finance them. Wastewater, I think, you know. But we have wastewater committees. I think that's the official term, it's dormant anyway. This plan has nothing to do with wastewater. Right. This is okay. stormwater. Storm 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 just stormwater. Just for clarification. Okay. Thank you. The, just in the one last point, there, we are very flexible, but there is a requirement before the plan is finished that there be some opportunity for some public input or participation, but that w that's been forecast through like a public meeting and a, so we're very, the department's very comfortable with the town's plans to, okay. to do the project. Scott, you all set? Yes. Okay. Um, I can make a motion? Sure, please. I move that we approve the agreement between uh, the town of Hopkinton and RIDEM, um, which will allow the town to be eligible for a grant in the amount of $25,000 for to develop a stormwater management program plan. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And of the SWMPP, the swamp. <laughs> I thought that was really appropriate. It's called swamp. I know it's an acronym. It's the cutest acronym. Absolutely appropriate. Yep. All right, what do we need? Next on the agenda under new business is to consider, discuss, and act upon an agreement between the Town of Hopkinton and Huss and O'Neill, Inc. to assist the Town in the development of the, and impl implementation of the Town-wide Stormwater Management Program Plan. Okay, move that the Hopkinton Town Council approve the agreement between the Town of Hopkinton and Fuss and O'Neill, whereby they will assist in the development and impl implementation of a Town-wide Stormwater Management Program Plan. Second. Second. Discussion. Any discussion? Yes. Yes, Sylvia. Um, I asked Bill earlier, perhaps for the record, you could let um, let us know um, the um, that I just let everybody know that we have gone out to bid with uh, Fusco, Fusco and O'Neill in the past, and their contract we would be going out to bid again next. You said when was it? In the spring. Right. So okay, just to let people know, this is something that we have gone out to bid and selected them in the past. And they're our current um, engineering uh, firm that we uh, re re rely upon and have worked with and appreciate. Is anyone here tonight? Yes. Good, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Councillor Thompson for bringing that up because when I was <coughs> reading this, that into my mind about the bidding, so the bidding situation won't be a problem. So it's good. I thank you. <laughs> and Jim Reardon is here tonight if the council has any further questions. Okay. Um, Barbara? Mine is sort of a question, but it's a comment. Um, in the contract, the grantee shall ensure that at least 10% of the dollar value of entire grant project performed shall be performed by a disadvantaged business enterprise, and also that 20% agrees to use non-toxic ink and recycled paper. This is something Fuss and O'Neill will take care of. We do not have to deal with this. Is that correct? That's what you yes. want me. Yeah, yes, you if you could, please. I just want, these are two hmm. kind of tiny, no, no, uh, absolutely, and uh, I understand the uh, the items that you mean. Um, in the proposal that we sent, we reflected uh, those items from the grant agreement that related to uh, minority business enterprises, women-owned business enterprises. So you will take care so of that, that for us. So we'll that, take care of that. The only That's question I have for you. Thank you. Sure. David. Okay. 
Anyone else have any questions on this? Okay, we have a motion. It was seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is to discuss and consider the adoption of a resolution whereby the Hopkinton Town Council respectfully requests that the legislative delegations of the towns of Hopkinton, Charlestown, and Richmond, as well as the city of Cranston, take all steps necessary to include an appropriation in the amount of 258,866 to Cranston and $158,290.12 to Charahoe in the fiscal year 2014 state budget. I, I wanna just give everyone a, an idea of how this came about. I attended uh, with uh, Bill McGarry and the other town council presidents, um, Joe Reddish from, from Richmond and uh, Tom Gentz from Charlestown. And the superintendent, Barry Ritchie, had asked uh, the three presidents to uh, help out with some certain matters, and this being one of them. And basically, this, this issue was, uh, I believe, litigated and mediated in Charahoe's favor. And it was regarding the career and technical center's salary, benefits, and travel expenses to the tune of $158,290. So this matter has been litigated, as I mentioned, and, and mediated in Charahoe's favor. We just are asking our representatives uh, at the State House and the governor to include it in their upcoming budget so that they can award it to Charahoe. So I, I thought it was an, an easy thing to do for, for, for Charahoe. It's not often times we have a chance to give them or try and get them some money because uh, we don't really partake in their money issues, but I thought this was an easy thing to do for us, and, and that's basically how it came about, and uh, I hope we can pass the resolution. Um, I make see. a motion that, that that resolution is suggested uh, be approved. Should I read it? Not not necessary. Necessary. Oh, okay. All right. That's second. So, oh, second, okay, any discussion? Yes. Uh, okay. What I found interesting is I contacted Mayor Fung of Cranston today, and he didn't know anything about it. Now, I know um, the mayor uh, doesn't run the schools, but you would have thought that the superintendent of schools or the chairman of the school committee or the council would have passed on to the mayor. And, uh, but I do have a copy of the communication. I made sure that the council president, the town manager knew that, but I just find it, uh, he didn't know what I was talking about. And obviously it's, it's a financial issue. But I was reading something, I was trying to find it, but there's a bigger issue here that concerns me, and that is the, this continued uh, lack of appreciation I think the state has regarding vocational technical education. It's my understanding, if <coughs> I'm staying corrected, that Davies, Votech, and Met schools are like totally funded by the state, That's and correct. these others aren't. I believe that the children of Washington County, as well as any other part of the state that has these uh, vocational schools, they should receive the same consideration financially from the state that these other two schools do. Uh, they're all Rhode Island's children. And uh, I think maybe we should think of coming up a, a resolution or something insisting that the state treat all vocational technical schools the same when it comes to finances. Uh, because, uh, and I was trying to look at it a bit, but I was looking at a pod in here that said, it said like, uh, Charaho takes in like Charaho Westerly, Narragansett, mm -hmm. uh, I believe South Kingstown. I was looking at the list here. Uh, but it would seem that uh, uh, it's out uh, of just fairness that they would, uh, we should probably address that somehow. And that's all I got to say, but uh, I'm proud to move that. I'm a little surprised, and I've known Mayor Fung for several years now, that just as a courtesy, the Mayor Cranston didn't know about this. That's because it began in 2008. This is all from 2008, so probably in four years, he, if he was there, great, but if not, he may just not have known of it. That's when it began. But it's a money issue when you think that right. uh, normally the mayor would know I, that. Oh, I they're, they're richer than us, Scott, so yeah. that's why. <laughs> anyway, um, Sylvia, do you have any comments? Yeah, um, I have to admit it, it is disappointing that we would even have to bother to do mm -hmm. such a thing um, if there's an agreement that's been made and it involved state government mm -hmm. with the town and the school department and ride and on and on, um, you would think it would just be handled 
and far as I'm concerned, they should it just should be paid out, you cut a check, and you pay them. You don't have to ask for a special appropriation. But obviously, anyway, it's just disappointing that it doesn't work that way. So we'll do whatever we need to do to support the school so that they can get the money they need. Thank you. David? Yeah, Frank, I'm a little new on the scene here. How do we get tied in with Cranston? I think I can explain Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. A suit was brought by Charaho and Cranston to recoup these funds because they were both in identical positions in terms of receiving the funds. Okay. So the two, you know, the two school departments basically were claiming they were owed this money. So they joined together to file a suit against the Department of Education in order to get these funds. A settlement was reached. Yep. They met, talked about it, settled it. But the settlement was contingent upon funding being provided by the state to fund the settlement mm -hmm. because the Department of Education would not take the funds out of their budget. So they wanted the governor to appropriate additional funds in order to pay this settlement. Has the Department of Education included these funds in their budget request? No, they will not include them in their so budget. They, so they approved giving us the money, but they didn't put the money in their budget. Right. They said that the right. governor needed to appropriate it directly. And so you can see the problem. The governor's yeah. got, to got to put into his budget, I forget, I don't know how much it totals, over $300,000 to fund this settlement in order for it to go through. So that the Cranston School Department, the Charitable School Department, in the same position, they're just getting different funds of money. That's how we all kind of wound up in the thing together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we have a motion. Was it seconded, Lisa? It's just reserved. Oh, okay. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next on the uh, new business agenda is discussion regarding the setting of the March 20th, 2013 as a workshop for 2013 Community Development Block Grant application. So we have to Yeah, I wanted to point out that um, we only had a workshop one year. We don't normally, or we have never had workshops for this purpose. Um, as you could see from the documents, uh, there'll be a February 14th for the first hearing in Richmond where applications for nonprofits, or they can come in and, and, and make their comments. Um, the um, Hopkinton Planning Board has a date where they're, they'll uh, up, take up these, these items. Um, the town council will have their hearing on the matter on uh, April 15th, but we'll actually, the town will actually be in receipt of all the applications. I think it's like February 21st yeah. um, from Jim's memo. Um, so we don't need a workshop. We only had a workshop one year because one counselor was going to be on vacation and, or out of the state and requested that we have a workshop. Um, so I don't see a need for a workshop. It would just be, a, um, I don't know, it's unnecessary. So we'll have our hearing, and we'll get those applications in February. We'll have plenty of time to look at them and then ask our questions. Okay. Barbara? Um, I was the one who asked for that workshop, and I'm still asking for it for March 20th. <coughs> we get the application from CDBG February 21st. Um, it is up to us to go through the applications and then to be able to ask the people from who have applied. They would come to our hearings so that we could discuss with them what they wanted, why they wanted it, so that we have some idea of how we would like to position them in the CDBG approval process. If we only meet on April 15th as a hearing, then we have no time to hear from them and be able to think about how we think that the applications should be um, listed before the application is due four days later on April 19th. So I want to ask again for having a meeting on the 20th so that we can look at the CDBG, be able to talk to the people who are putting the applications in, because this is our money um, given to this town and for this town. And then we'll be able to discuss it amongst ourselves and amongst the people here so that when we come to the public hearing, we will each of us have a list of how we would like to see these things in priority. And I think that's important. This is money that we probably get 20% of what we ask for, but it is money that I think we need to be able to really think about how we want to distribute it um, in the town and not just have no chance to think about it. So I would very much like to have the March 20th Oh, there was uh, one time thing to I... review the application. Yep. 
There was yeah, one so thing I forgot to bring up. The um, workshop that we had last year, um, it happened to be on April 9th, 2012, and um, the, not, all ap not, not all the applicants were there in attendance, and at that particular workshop, no questions were asked of anyone. Um, it was only for council um, information, I guess. Um, but um, the, I, I just want to caution everybody that the, the hearing schedule you know, has been, the way we've had it has worked for years. I don't need a, a workshop to talk to um, some of the people because they're not required to be there. Um, at the hearing that we have, they'll all be there because they all have a stake in this. And we can ask them all the questions we want. We'll have the applications ahead of time. So um, I, don't, I don't need, well anyway, so I, I don't want to get into the personalities about it, but I don't see a need for it. Okay, Scott, do you have an opinion on it? I, uh, I would concur with Councilor Thompson on this. I think that we both have an objective and subjective view of these things. Uh, I know uh, Councilor Husband is new to the council, but a lot of us pretty well know uh, these groups. We also have a view on what we believe individually uh, what would benefit Hopkin and as far as what social welfare groups we should put or uh, projects and how we should rank them. And there's always maybe some disagreement among us. Uh, I know, uh, I think it was last year you had a situation where uh, somebody thought the other, the other areas were uh, taken care of in the past and they didn't rank them as high, if I remember correctly. Uh, so I, I just prefer uh, uh, to have that hearing. You know, this town council as a body, as an institution, deserves the respect enough that when people come and expect money from the town of Hopkins, they should appear or have a representative. Mm -hmm. And I think what Councilor, Capa uh, not Councilor Capalbo, uh, Councilor Thompson just pointed out is the fact that we had uh, a workshop in not everybody showed up. And Tom and I were missing. We said we couldn't make that time. Last year, it was specific. We both had um, time constraints that we could not come to the meeting. And we needed to be here. So we had to send things by letter because we couldn't be at the hearing. You need to be able to speak to people to find out what you would like to do and how you'd like to do it. There are some organizations that will need more attention one year than another set of organizations. We lost all of our money for um, renovating homes because it all went into another category. We lost everything. We can't afford to do that. There are things that are important for us to make sure that CDBG knows are important. And we need to speak to people, we need to speak among ourselves and say this is what is important for our town, this is where we'd like our money to go. But last year specifically it was done in a tight time frame both Tom and I could not make it, and it was most frustrating that you only got to see it at the one hearing, and now suddenly you had to juggle things. I think it's something, since it is up to $100,000 that we need to give away, <coughs> that we should spend some time looking at that so that we can make our decision on what makes the most sense for the town but we lost all of the money that we could have done anything for renovating homes, and I thought that was awful. Barbara, if I could just okay, um, no, one, one second. Sorry. You're going to be here this time, though, right? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. So I'd like right. to be there at the March 20th and April 15th. If you, if you only discuss on the 15th, you have to not only hear it, you have to discuss it and make the decision that night because the application is due four days later, April 19th. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that you need at least a couple of weeks to think about it, balance it, ask other questions if you need so that we can make a determination where this $100,000 goes. Well, it's only a ranking. We don't, we don't, we, uh, we, yeah, I understand it's not, that. That's not our money directly, but it does come to the town. But right. I want to ask the clerk if I could, Lisa, prior to these, uh, this meeting, I guess, um, we would have the informational <coughs> packets for these uh, nonprofits. Well, I would believe that that was the case. The applications right. are due to the town from the outside agencies on February 21. Okay. I believe the board of, uh, the board will We'll discuss them first, but I would expect that they, the council would have them. I guess my point, would we have these well in advance for us to do our own ranking and have any questions for that night? Jim, could you maybe weigh in on that for a second? 
please. Sure, it's, it's my intention to give the council everything that comes in by the 21st as soon as possible, which is, in this case, it's going to be almost two months before the public hearing before the town council. So okay. you'll have, you'll have a lot more time than you had last year. Okay. I know it was a problem last year. You'll have a lot more time this year to uh, sit them. back and read them thoroughly, rank them, et cetera. Okay, I think that helps. Jim, thank you. David, did you have any questions? Well, as long as we have enough time to prioritize yeah. the lists and, and and look over the information that's provided to us, I don't have any problem with this, but I want I want that time to prioritize yeah. and to have some discussion on the matter. Yeah, I think... Which would it be at the public Last year it was condensed, so, you know, that was a just a quick process, unfortunately, but this year we'll have plenty of time, and uh, I don't think that we'll... Um, given that two-month time frame, I don't think that we'll need to have... A, have a uh, workshop. Can, can we expect these organizations to come in to see us at the, at the public hearing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Be so, so the, with so bells this, and whistles. The, this, this would suffice in a sense uh, as opposed to maybe a workshop with, with them coming in. Yeah, but it's, if they're not required to at the workshop, that's the problem. So, okay. Right. Um, oh, by the way, so um, yeah. at that uh, workshop, uh, just for the, so you'll be, everybody's on the same page, um, the workshop that we did have. Um, I was missing and Barbara was missing. Tom ran the meeting. I, I told everyone I would not be here because I thought the meeting was not for the right purpose. So I refused to go and Tom ran the meeting. Okay. I would. So Hold on, Scott. One second. Barbara? Um, the other thing that we need to make sure, if we could, Jim, this is a question for you, is that the CDBG funds that we rank, um, in the past, CDBG has also pre assigned money without our um, input? Will we make sure that we know what is pre-assigned at that same meeting or at the time we receive the CDBG funds? Remember they have yes. pre-assigned money that we have no control over? Correct. Uh, sometimes and they're, they're not pre-commitments. Um, well, I'd like to uh, keep in mind that on the 14th of February, we're going to have a tri-town meeting in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Marchant, who's our CDBG coordinator, will be there running it. There will be a good number. It was very well attended the last couple of years I went. Uh, some, some of the agencies that are going to be applying to us will be there. So at, I would suggest that in lieu of a workshop, we could use that 14th meeting as an opportunity to give some guidance to the applicants coming in here to find out from Jeff what the state has pre-committed to uh, again, uh, the only pre-commitment that I'm aware of was uh, uh, the Rockville Mill. They, Rockville they, Mill, many years in a row, but it cost us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we had no control over, and it was a major error, and they even admitted it as a major error. Right. I don't want to see that happen again. We don't get that much money, and when we get the money, I want to make sure that our fingers are on it. Okay, this is a scheduling motion, so let's try and stick to the scheduling okay. issue, guys. We so do we need a motion to set a to set the hearing date? What was the oh. hearing date for Hopkinton? It was the April fifteenth. Yeah. You want a motion? No, no not, for, not, not for the public hearing. No. Okay. We, we can. Setting the workshop is all. Okay. Um, I guess Scott, do you want? to? I just wanted to say that when I the comment wasn't directed to about Council Capalbo or Buck, it was about these organizations. They should, if the council has a meeting, they should have a representative here. And I believe that the turnout, and I did take into consideration Council's Capaldo's concern about Ride Cam last year, and I did bring that up. Okay. Uh, Thanks. That yeah, out. so there are opportunities, which you were saying, and, and if anybody wants to ask any questions early on, they could go to Richmond on the 14th, and then the Hopkinton Planning Board's going to take it up, so there's another chance, and then we'll have our Town Council hearing on April 15th. Correct. So that would be our third chance. Correct. Okay. And I'd like to ask the, the planner. I believe that the final decision is the, the state's decision and also I believe they take into consideration the requests of other t area towns in compiling what we get to. I mean they also consider Richmond and Charleston I believe, don't they, when it comes to human resources. So it's not those factors also go into the ultimate decision. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong on that. No, you're, you're right on both counts. Uh, the state does have the final say as to who gets what and it is competitive across the state. Uh, everything that we approve here is going to be uh, uh, competing against 
other applications in other towns. But also they take into consideration if it's like a social welfare thing like Richmond or Charleston, they will also consider supporting that organization by including what they think our share should be. Correct. A number of the applicants who apply through Hopkinton also have similar applications in other towns and um, uh, quite often they're funded in multiple towns to get enough money to get to do the job that they, uh, they have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, guys, let's, um, let's vote on this, whether we need a workshop or not. I, uh, I don't think we need one based on the time frames allotted to us this year for this uh, non for the nonprofit stuff, for the community development block grants. Um, so can we do a vote or do we, it's or a, is it's consensus okay? Consensus. consensus. Well, Scott, oh, I I, I'll say you. I, I think my opinion is, is stated. I'm well, stated confident again, with uh, the uh, not, not have a workshop. Okay. So I don't need a workshop. No, I don't think we do either, based on the time frames. I've seen too many problems with it. I'd still like to see it. Okay. A workshop. Okay. So it looks like uh, three, three, four, three of them. Four to one. We will not have a workshop on the 20th of CDBG. Next on the agenda is the uh, general discussion and update of the Charitable School District security measures. Chief of Police, Dave Palmer. Good evening. Uh, I've been asked to uh, update you on, uh, on school security since uh, the uh, tragedy at Sandy Hook. I uh, want to ensure you that the Hopkins police always took sc school security very seriously, um, as we do now. Um, obviously, this, uh, this raises the bar. Before we, before the Sandy Hook tragedy, we had already had several uh, uh, active shooting uh, um, in-service training, which are eight-hour trainings uh, that are federally funded. We actually had uh, one about two weeks prior to the to the shooting itself. So it's something we take very seriously. Uh, Charleston police was there, Richmond police, as well as Hopkins police. Uh, next year, we expect that. It's, um, the funding uh, comes federally, and we expect that will probably be expanded. And we will—I'd like to make that a mandatory training for all our officers. Um, I'll kind of give you an idea of what we've done since the tragedy itself is that uh, we've actually passed out the uh, the uh, um, the updated crisis plans from all the uh, schools within Hopkinton Police, also outside the Charleston police and Richmond police because if there's an active shooter, everybody's going. And we all need to know what the other person is uh, or the other police department is uh, is doing. Um, on January 8th, myself, uh, Chief Johnson, and Chief Allen from uh, Richmond and Charleston met with uh, Barry Ritchie, the superintendent, to kind of get an idea of what they wanted with, with the police departments uh, because obviously we, we want to give the most protection without putting out the most fear to, to, to kids. I think the, uh, the high school and the middle school have all, all always been used to that. They, they develop that mentality when, uh, when they come of age. Um, it's in the elementary school where they have not um, developed that and there's a kind of a fine line between uh, making sure they're safe and, that, and putting fear in their life. Um, so it was important to include him, and so without going into to real specifics of what um, our departments are doing on an everyday basis, uh, particularly hours of what, when we're going down there, I can tell you this, is that we have a very, very active role with our police officers in all the, the schools, including, um, including going into Cherahoe, um, to go to do drive-bys, recognizing that th that's Richmond, but we need to have a presence as, as well. We have students there, and um, we've we've had a pretty good relationship. We've always had a great relationship, I should say, with Richmond police. But our juvenile officer is very uh, very close to their uh, their uh, resource officer. So whenever there's a uh, say rumor or some information coming out that is concerning to any of the police departments, 
it's a quick quick response and it's uh interagency is very very good uh we get along great and we've had a couple of those since then um they were not they were rumors um but it didn't mean that we would take them any uh, any lighter than, and i I, I think you can recognize that when something like that comes out, we're going we're gonna to follow it to where we can't follow it any further. Um, we've also reached out to the uh, to preschools and uh, to kind of get on the, on the mentality. And the mentality we've tried to betray uh, is this. And we, uh, again, we've, we've be, even before this, uh, Cherho Task Force is a great organization. Uh, they have had their students try to, trying to keep their students involved in keeping the police informed on what we need to be informed on. Uh, prior to this, we had uh, uh, Richmond had developed uh, what's called Text a Tip, which is a, uh, a form of anonymously providing tips to the police departments uh, that uh, so people will not feel any peer pressure in getting some information out to us. Um, obviously that they, they can be our ears. Uh, they're going to be our, they hear things that we don't hear and we need to get out to the, the mentality to the to the staff, the administration, and to the parents that you need to call the police if there's anything suspicious and that's kind of been my recruitment to each one of the uh, principals and to the uh, directors at the uh, preschool is is you have a, you have a lot of set of eyes with parents coming to and from uh, school and um, and this is this just does not pertain to the school it pertains to any type of crime B and E's as such but they have to have uh, they have to pick up the phone and they have to call and I, I kind of give it a uh, the, the Monday after the Friday of the shooting, um, I went down to the Ashway Elementary School, and this is, I, I give this as an example, is that uh, I, I watched a gentleman 100 yards from the, uh, from the school, uh, should not have been there. He's got a Connecticut plate, the car was clearly out of place, so wasn't he. And I sat there and watched, watched what he was doing. And he was outside so everybody could see, and there was parent after parent after parent went by. And it was concerning to me that we didn't receive one call. And this is the mentality I need to change. When I approached him, and there was really, he wasn't doing anything he shouldn't have been doing, but I think this is what we need to get out to the, to, to the public is, and that's what we're trying to do through the, uh, through the newsletters with the school department, through um, the Chairho Task Force, uh, to get the parents more involved, get students more involved in calling the police. Uh, there's only so many police officers out there, but there's a lot of public out there. And if we get, I'd rather get 50 calls that turn out to be nothing than to miss the one call that we really needed to get. And um, so that's kind of the mentality that we're trying to betray. Um, we have to recognize that uh, this is the game changer, um, that we're not going back to what it was before. Uh, the elementary school have been drawn into a uh, volatile situation, and hopefully we can we can keep this um, keep this to a minimum. But I think what it, the way it's going to be done is keeping a presence there and and having deterrence um, that that it's not it basically not not a soft soft target at all. Um, I've reached out to the. Uh, the principals, and this is kind of on a, a lower level, but it certainly is probably more prevalent in the schools, is that um, there's many domestics, but there's always one or two children in the schools that are, um, their families are uh, in disarray, and one of the parents' main, there may, be, uh, there may be restraining orders and such, and we don't always get called on those. Um, I'd like to get ahead of the curve on those and, and, and get them to call us before there's, a, say, a family, uh, a, a, a family problem in school, whether, whether it be a teacher, a parent conference, uh, let us know about this. Uh, in one instance since this, uh, I suggest that we had an officer 
in the near in nearby uh, vicinity because one of the, the gentleman was a uh, kind of a volatile person, and so he had to drive by the police officer to to go to his conference or put some uh, something in his mentality that okay, the police are right around the corner. This is what uh, what we as uh, the community, Charleston, Richmond, and Hopkinton want to get out, um, get, get ahead of the curve. If you hear something that's going on uh, that is suspicious, uh, if you have problems within the school department, don't wait until it's exasperated, until now you're calling us right when we could be in the area. So these are the things that I've, uh, that we have talked to, to the school departments. I think they're very, very receptive. Uh, I stopped by last week to all the uh, the school departments to find out what uh, what we could do better, and they were they're very excited about how it's been ha handled. Um, they they just hope it continues, and I expect that it's it's going to continue for a while. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Uh, David, do you uh, have any no, questions or comments, Barbara? Um, I know you're working with Richmond and Cherro Hill is very much on the Richmond side of the border, and I know the police are really in charge of Cherro Hill and Richmond. Um, how are you working with them? Because the buildings are so scattered, the middle school and the high school, and the, uh, the CTC center. I mean, everything is very scattered. Have you um, consulted with Richmond, um, you, Charleston and Hopkinton, on how you would handle that whole facility? I mean, who comes in from which angles? So yes. Have yeah. you? We have talked about that, yes. Because that's such a huge structure. I just don't even know how you'd... <coughs> those without are, without those, tripping on each other. Those are things that have already been in place uh, prior to the, to the, the tragedy. Um, so when we were doing active shooting uh, seminars down at uh, Chair, they were at Cherho, and mm -hmm. And that's discussed at that time. What department's going where, so that we're not like, as you say, tripping over each other. You don't want five here and nobody over here. Um, we do, we have discussed that. And when it's not, uh, it's not say an active shooter. When we're going down there on a, just an everyday basis. Basically, we're allowing uh, Richmond as a lead, mm -hmm. and their SRO is their contact person. So. Uh, when we're down there, if we're going into the schools, the SRO officer knows that we're there. Okay. And you've been talking to the elementary schools and organizing that, how you'd handle those schools too? Yes, we, we, we expect, uh, I think it's uh, sometime this month, they haven't set a date yet, but they have a, uh, they have a safety conference, uh, at least I know Ashway is, I'm not sure about Hope Valley, but, uh, but we'll be in contact with them. And this will, be a, this will turn out to be a, a regular thing, and, and um, it's, a, it's a good thing. Yeah. You also have Yes, yeah, thank okay. you. Um, Sylvia? Um, I, um, from my own experiences with, with my children, when they were young, uh, elementary school age, um, and that was, that just went to the fourth grade then at that time, um, I think one of the things that I think we all know um, is that the more involvement that the um, that a officer, that, that a police department actually has on one-to-one -one, um, with a class um, in, in those lower grades, so they can be up close to an officer, so they can touch the uniform, touch the badge, meet the fella, hear your voice, which is very reassuring. I think that if you had um, interactions with them, um, However, often the school, for instance, if there was something, some activity, or for some reason you were at in, an, in the auditorium, you got to get up close with the kids and, and greet them. I think that um, I think that goes a long way, uh, especially for the young kids, so that they don't they they have actually met their local police officer. They know his badge number or oh, mom, he was a nice guy. I mean, the more interaction you have, I think, with the young grades, um, I think it's a good idea. So I'd, I'd, I'd applaud you if you can get in there or greet them when they come and go, um, when they're on their way, when they're coming in the morning or they're getting on the bus. I think it's important um, that at that a young age that they meet there, uh, just like they do um, with open houses and when they have fire departments and they get to see the truck, mm -hmm. the fire truck. 
So um, at any opportunity that you get to do that, I think it would be welcomed by the school department, and I think the kids would enjoy it for sure. And, and when I say we have presence there, presence isn't just driving through there. At, at least one day, one time a day, our officers are getting out and walking the hallways. Oh, good. Uh, and so, and I know it's a big difference from the first time I went down mm -hmm. there to to now when I went down the last time there. They're, they're getting um, more comfortable you being there. It's not such a big deal as mm -hmm. a police officer being in the school. So I think it's a, it's a good thing in many levels. Uh, I think they're getting more comfortable around police officers and um, just having us in there um, is not as traumatic as it you know as it was not for bad time. reasons for good reasons the correct yes. correct and they then they start looking at you as a friend not a, uh, mm -hmm. a foe mm -hmm. so. I know what you mean yeah, yeah. Scott do you have any comments yeah did this was the Rhode Island State Police involved in any of these discussions I spoke to Lieutenant Newberg out of the Hope Valley Barracks and uh, and I asked him um, if he could have his officers drive through there. I know they were at the uh, at the beginning. I'm not sure if they still are right now, uh, but for the first couple of weeks, I know they were. But they haven't been involved in any meetings at Charo at all. Yeah, when we go to uh, we go to the Charo task force, sometimes he's there, uh, they're there. They also have a, a different task force. Uh, uh, they, it's a drug task force, which is they have, they've had them for years. They uh, the the troopers always go to that. So, the the only observation I was I wasn't going to really comment, but I think if you were to take school security throughout the United States, I mean, it probably varies from one place to another. It's probably a little more like in New York City. I'm sure it's a little more stringent. I would assume with the urban areas, but I mean, most schools I would imagine you have to uh, buzz your way in. You have to talk to a speaker. You just can't walk into a school nowadays. I think. Uh, that's the way it is here now. Yeah, because I know uh, even when we have a meeting, uh, you go in and it says report to the office if you go in. But I think, is there any is there any school buildings in Cherro that you can automatically walk into without being, uh, you know, putting a buzzer in? Not that I've gone to. Yeah. I have no other comments. Thanks, Scott. Questions. Yeah, Chief, I want to applaud you and your uh, department for, for this uh, extra security measures. I know when we were at the omnibus meeting, uh, Barry Ritchie, the superintendent, did uh, say how proud he was of the three departments and the three chiefs, uh, you included. So I want to thank you for all your efforts. And um, I just had a, a quick question, I guess, on um, how do you see briefly, like long term? Do you think there's going to be a resource officer in every school, you think, eventually down the road? Do you, you think time will tell? Who knows? Or? You know, I've reached out uh, to some people I know about trying to see about getting some type of uh, some grants and such. I think there's going to be some grants that are coming. Um, would it be every every uh, school? I, I'm not sure if they uh, the the United States can afford it. I mean, there's a lot of schools out there, and uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, our children are our greatest resources, so. Uh, if you're going to invest in anything, I guess that's the best place to invest. So. Yeah, I think there's 156,000 schools or something like that in the country. So anyway, that puts it in perspective. But anyway, uh, does anybody else have anything for uh, Chief Palmer? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, next on the agenda is to set a hearing date for the waiver of interest on overdue quarterly tax payment proposed ordinance. Amendment to Chapter 19 Taxation, sponsored by okay. What? Uh, how can we? When can we get this well, on? It has to be advertised three times okay. prior to a, a meeting. So I believe in looking at the calendar coming up, it looks like March 4th will be your earliest opportunity. Okay. okay. Anybody have any objections to that? Or sounds good. Okay. Let's do that. March 4th, 2013. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, next on the agenda is boards and commissions. Consider appointments to the following boards and commissions, Affordable Housing Partnership, Animal Control Commission, and Tax Board of Review. Does anyone um, want to make a I'll move that we appoint uh, Mimi Carlson to the Affordable Housing Partnership, or I should say reappoint. Any second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. So we have three. 
for uh, Should I abstain because I wasn't there for that? You were not there. You have to abstain. I'll abstain. Okay, so one abstention, one no, three. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dave doesn't have to abstain just because he did an interview. He can still have an opinion on whether she should be on the board or not. So it's not, you, it's not a prerequisite to voting that you have interviewed her. Okay. Whether you want to do it, Dave, or not is up to you. I'll abstain. Okay, there you go. Okay. I'd like to make an appointment of Robert Green to the Animal Control Commission. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Also like to make um, Jeff Hall an appointment to the Tax Board of Review. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. I move that we appoint Mike Broncato to the Tax Board of Review. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Okay. <coughs> Next uh, is the second and last public forum. Anyone out there wishing to speak? Okay. We have a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, folks. Thank you.